you so much for joining us here at the Research Her, the show working to improve the health disparities for women of color one topic at a time. I am Alicia. I'm here learning and growing with you as we research our way to well-being. Welcome, welcome. Hey, hey. So today, like all other guests, this one is bomb.com. And today we have Mrs. Paige Brown, who has such a sweet soul. And I was interested in interviewing her because she has a very interesting story. So she went to North Carolina A&T for undergrad, where she majored in electrical engineering. And then upon graduation, she started working as an actual electrical engineer. You know, a lot of people, once they leave undergrad, they don't even use that major. But she did, and she soon found that her job was not that welcoming, and she experienced some interesting things while at work, which I won't give it away. You will need to read her book. But electrical engineering is a very white male-dominated field and they weren't having it with this black woman coming in and all standing up for herself or whatever so she wrote about it in her book a black woman's guide to conquering challenges in the workplace when I originally interviewed her I had not yet read the book but since interviewing her I have and let me tell you something I went from infuriated being super mad and her telling her story it was some good tips for pretty much anyone who is just in a space where they are unsure and they're not necessarily happy, but, you know, they're trying to figure out how to make the most of where they are right now. She also challenges you in, like, asking, is it even worth it to be there? Do you need to leave? She ended up leaving her workplace later on to pursue another degree, which is a doctorate in engineering education, where she is currently trying to understand the Black woman's experience in in the engineering workforce. And also she cares about improving the K through 12 engineering education of underrepresented minorities. But also she has given birth to her beautiful baby, Ethan Alexander Brown. She gives us a little bit of her experience about being pregnant while in graduate school. So with that, let's get into Mrs. Paige Brown's story. So today we have Paige Brown in the building. I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes. Yes. So we're going to get started on our icebreaker questions. What is your ratchet pleasure? Oh, my ratchet pleasure is watching The Real Housewives of Atlanta. So you follow everything? Yes. I love that show. (laughs) (laughs) That's That's my weekly dose of ratchetness. And... If you could break the law one time, what would you do? Oh, my goodness. I don't like this question. Um, What would I do if I could break the law? So maybe I would take some people out of jail. Um, Some people who have been wrongly convicted or individuals who have been given these long sentences that they don't deserve. Nice. So if that counts as breaking the law, I would do that. Yes, that's breaking the law. You know, we like to put people in jail for no reason. It's just, Mm -hmm. that's our country. (laughs) Yeah. So let's get to the interview. So did you always know that you will be pursuing a career in engineering and engineering education? So no, I didn't. I would say that going all the way back to high school, um, when it was time for me to get ready to apply for schools, to figure out what I wanted to major in, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I knew where I wanted to go to school, but I just didn't know what I wanted to major in. And so it was really influence from family members that led me to pursue engineering for my undergraduate degree. Um, I had an older cousin who I looked up to as far as everything, and she was an electrical engineer. And so I was like, maybe I could be an electrical engineer. And I also had an uncle who was an engineer. And he said, you're good in math and science. 
you should do engineering. And he was wh- whispering in my mom's ear, they make a lot of money. You should <laughs> So, of course, my mom gets on board. You should do engineering. And so that's where my pursuit of and career of engineering came from, from family influence. As far as engineering education, I didn't always know that's what I wanted to do. I always was involved with education in some form or fashion. Like when I was a kid or a teenager, I used to volunteer at Vacation Bible School. I was always mentoring or tutoring people in college, that type of thing, volunteering with students. And so I had a passion for working with students, which eventually ended up leading me to engineering education along the road. Yeah. That's pretty that's pretty cool. So tell us uh, a little bit more about your undergraduate experience. So you went to North Carolina A&T. Uh, what were some experiences that shaped your path? Yes, I want to say Aggie pride. Um, I love my HBCU. So some things that shaped my path at a and I just had a great experience overall. I had a great time. Of course, I was majoring in engineering. Engineering is hard, difficult. It is not easy at all. But outside of academics, I was a golden delight in the band. So I twirled the baton and dance in my university's mm-hmm. marching band. And that took up so much time, like, and I really had to manage my engineering schoolwork um, with being in the band because black college bands practice until late at night. Like they the football players, right? (laughs) Yes, it's ridiculous. But with Golden Delight, I learned so much about discipline. And I think that discipline has come with me throughout my whole academic experience and career, and I've learned certain values that are in me still to this day. Um, I joined Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, which also helped to shape my path. I had summer internships that I acquired through attending career fairs at a and A&T has a great career fair. People come out looking for engineering students, and those summer internship experiences allow me to interact with different companies and individuals, which eventually led me to my first position. I won't get into that just yet. But I would say the lifelong friendships with individuals from my major band, aka, that has helped shape me over time, just growing and developing as a woman. Um, I think A&T was really crucial to my development. One other thing I think I really like found my passion at a and because I volunteered and worked with students so much. I was an academic success coach for freshmen. I had a part-time job at an early childhood education center one semester. I was doing so much. I don't know how I did I so good. I don't know it's just... how either. Wow, girl, oh. you are magic. <laughs> But yeah, I I realized one day on the playground with the students, this is what I want to do. I want to work with students in education some way, somehow. I just don't know like how it's going to happen. And so at that point, it was too late because I was almost done with, with my engineering program and I was graduating soon. So I continued on through my engineering program, graduated, and I've probably said too much more than what has shaped my path. No, I love all of this. I actually wanted to ask, like, how did you balance all of this? Did you have a social life or what? how do you feel about your college social life? First year, it was just straight band people, band people and the people who I had classes with. I always kept my schoolwork first. Like after class, I would immediately begin my homework and then we would go to band practice. I would always make sure my homework was done. And I would also get close to my classmates Mm -hmm. and we would form study groups and I would make sure that I would follow up with them or ask them questions if I had questions. Sometimes there would be all nighters where I would have to stay. I don't have to stay up late. I don't know how I did it then because I can't do it now. But um, it was it was really some hard work. And I after I crossed AKA, 
I took one year off from the band because I really wanted to um, enjoy that experience with being in the sorority and participating in everything that we had going on. So that year, I would say I really branched out and met other people outside of my major, outside of my dorm and the band. My senior year, I went back to the band. So I did three years in the band, freshman year, sophomore year and senior year. Okay, so you are at HBCU, and it seems like you have a full experience. Like, that is so cool. Like, you get the band experience, you get the Greek experience. Like, it just seems like you had such a full experience. How was the support as an engineering student at your HBCU? I would say it was family oriented. Like everyone there wants you to succeed. The professors, your classmates, you work together as a team. Sometimes there would be some friendly competition, but I think everybody really wants you to succeed. Um, I remember I had one class, differential equations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, I had an F at midterms. Mm. And when I tell you, I was like, this, this can't happen. Like, my mama's not having this. And so, like, I studied my butt off. I went to the professor and let him know that, hey, what do I need to do to, like, bring this up? Extra credit work. I went to office hours so I could get additional assistance. I work over. And I ended up getting an A in that class. And I can just say that. Girl, I, yes. I don't know how that happened. But I, I really worked my butt off to bring that up. And the professor was really supportive. And he saw that I was trying to succeed. So I think that his, his support and help was really good. Dang, that's an amazing story. Uh, F to an A? That is crazy. That That's just... a good story. I do have that. I'm not this perfect A student because I did have one class. It was a statics class. I took it like three times. I, I dropped it the first time. I got a, was it a C or a D the second time? Then I had to take it again. And I finally brought that up to a B. And that's uh, still a success story because after the second time, a lot of people are like, you know what? This class not for me. I got to do this time. Like, you needed that one to graduate, I'm assuming, though. Yes. And it I had did. to be above a C minus. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a, it was the statics course. You went to an HBCU, but for your graduate programs, you switched to a PWI. So how was that transition from being at an HBCU to now you're at a PWI? Yeah. So I really didn't know what to expect. Like once I first got to campus, I was like, wow, this campus is so big. Like, never in my life have I seen a campus that big. <laughs> but in terms of, I guess, the makeup of the school, it was predominantly white, of course. That was a major difference. But I, I would say that I really didn't have many issues with that because of my experience in the workforce. Engineering is predominantly composed of white men. So I had been surrounded around that. And the individuals in my specific program, it was mostly white, but they had many other people from other countries. And so, yeah, but there were moments when I would get imposter syndrome thinking that, do I really belong here? Like, can I do this? Like, this is crazy. Like, these people are so smart. Am I supposed to be here? Yes, Paige, you're supposed to be here. You can do everything that these people are doing. And I found that out. I could do those things better than other people. So people say PWIs are more rigorous than HBCUs. And I know that HBCUs can be just as rigorous as PWIs. A&T has produced the most Black engineers. And there are so many other people outside of engineering who are successful, just as successful as others. And so I had to come to terms with Paige. You are capable and knowledgeable just like everybody else. And I am. I was um, this past year. Do you still feel like you have imposter syndrome at times or is this something that you feel only you experience like one year two years yes it's like a roller coaster it comes and goes and I have to continuously have those pep talks with myself because I mean you'll find yourself in different situations at different time points and you'll doubt yourself but you just have to push past that doubt 
And what made you switch from engineering and undergrad to education? I know you already established, like, in your head you wanted to work with kids, but how was that? Was there any resistance that you had within yourself to actually pursue it? So I wouldn't say there was resistance for myself, but there was resistance around me. (laughs) So, like, Family members or people telling me, you're an engineer, you make all this money, why do you want to go be a teacher? And I don't necessarily have to be a teacher, but that's what everybody equivalent associates education with being a teacher. There are so many other opportunities that you can pursue besides teaching at a high school or something like that. But once I started my first position after graduating, I became really involved with the National Society for Black Engineers, and I started a Nesby Junior chapter. So I was doing a lot of work with students. And that feeling that I had on the playground and that thought that this is what I'm supposed to be doing kept coming up. And I was like, Paige, we need to start making some steps towards that. Mm-hmm. So that's what made me pursue that master's in education. And then my now husband, we were girlfriend and boyfriend at the time. He moved um, to the DC area and I just wanted to find a job to be closer to him. So I found a new job, but I still wasn't doing anything to progress towards a career in education. And I had a friend who told me about Purdue's engineering education PhD program. So I applied and I was accepted. I got offered a fellowship that covered my tuition, fees, everything Mm. um, with a stipend. So it was like, how are you going to turn that down? Yeah. But still, like opposition from family. You want to leave that six-figure job for education, to go back to school. My husband, he was a little skeptical as well because he hadn't heard of engineering education and it's still fairly new. And even people from engineering disciplines, other engineering disciplines, they look at engineering education. They kind of look down on it as well. It's still trying to be received by those other disciplines, but we came up with an agreement that I could go mm-hmm. or do. <laughs> so how is balancing like being a wife with a PhD program? It is hard. <laughs> That's all I can say. It's very hard because he's not in school. He's not going through it. And Sometimes I can, no, I can't do this, babe. I can't go out here or there because I have to study. I have to do this work or get that done. And so it, it really is a balancing act trying to make time for him being a wife while also getting my work done. It's, it's like a different world going from working full time, the husband and wife, regular typical household, and then going back to a PhD program. It's like a totally different life. So it's a challenge and we're constantly working on it. He's doing really well with understanding when I need time to do work. And I'm trying to make sure that I get my work done so that I can spend time with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what I wondered, the time. The time is really why I asked, because it's like when you are doing so much, how can you balance all of the responsibilities? Right. And yes, because (laughs) he is my husband. He let me move to Indiana while he was in the D.C. area and stayed to begin my Ph.D. So I'm really thankful to him for that. And he was supportive through all of that. And so, like, I would talk to him all the time, FaceTime, in between classes, after classes before I go to bed, we would have to have that constant communication and be intentional with communicating while we were away from each other. So I am grateful to him for that because not too many men would go for their wife leaving them 11 hours away to leave their job and start a PhD program. We worked it out and and we're still going. Yeah. So how is it being a girl from down south up in Indiana? (laughs) Girl, that's cold that cold weather. I cannot deal with it. Oh my goodness. Indy Indiana. It's not that many of us mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to tell you what my husband said about Indiana, but <laughs> you can imagine. Um. <laughs> and in West Lafayette, it's like 
nothing. <laughs> yes. I'm from a small town, so. Okay, so that's I, nothing I, for you, yeah. Yeah, I can handle it. But, I mean, working in the D.C. area, I kind of got used to certain things. And West Lafayette didn't have any of that. Like, the restaurants aren't even that good. It was an adjustment, but I'm glad. Uh, it's over and I'm back. <laughs> what inspired you to continue to get your PhD after getting your master's in education? Why did you feel like this was the next step for you to take? Well, like I said, I really hadn't figured out how I would transition into education. I knew that's where I wanted to go. And when a friend told me about Purdue's engineering education program, um, I was like, engineering plus education education, that seems like a good fit. So I did research on the program, saw that there were so many areas that you could go in after you pursued this PhD. And so that really motivated me to continue on because I just didn't know how I would transition from engineering to education. I had even looked into becoming a teacher at a high school, um, teaching STEM or engineering. But for that, there's certain requirements that you have to have. And you have to become certified to teach Mm -hmm. certain grade levels. I don't know. I just really wasn't feeling that path at that moment. And so that PhD in engineering education program seemed like something more down my alley. And I could do more than just teach. I could go into policy work. I could go into developing programs. I could be a faculty member and a professor at a university. Or I could even set myself up to start my own school. Who knows? Okay, so what did your master's in education do for you? When I started my master's program, initially I started out with a master's of arts in teaching. But at some point, for some reason, I got lazy and was like, these are too many requirements. It's too many tests I got to take to be certified to be a teacher. Like, I don't have time for this. And I changed to a master's in education. And that program didn't have as many requirements. I didn't have to take the exams to become certified to teach. And I would finish the program quicker. If I could go back, I would change that and I would continue to pursue that specific degree where I would have become certified to teach. So that is what I would change if I could go back. And how was doing an online master's? Like that is hard. That is hard to do online school because I mean, you're not going into a classroom. There's no accountability. Like, did you feel challenged or was it like nothing for you? Like, this is nothing. For me, it wasn't that hard because I was, we really haven't talked about my experience working, but my first job that I had, I encountered so many challenges at that job, like just with people in general. And so for me, my outlet was working with Nesby Jr. and the students. And then I started my program. So that was really a motivator for me to do that schoolwork. And I would would do schoolwork at work. Don't tell anybody I was using their time. But, and then, like, I I would set up a schedule where immediately after work, I would spend at least an hour doing schoolwork because soon I would have to go meet with my students for Nesby Jr. So I really was on a schedule and, like, that motivation of I'm pursuing something that I want to do. I just can't stand going into work. It was like... Actually, it was like not a stress reliever, but something that I could look forward to. Um, I was also in an area that was country, southern Maryland, nothing there. So Mm -hmm. it it was something to do. And I really didn't have any trouble with that online program. I would say now, though, um, I'm taking an online class right now. It's a quantitative research methods class, statistics. And so that is... It's, it's actually more difficult for me now managing my time for some reason. Um, I don't know. Okay. And now you go to Purdue and it's time for you to choose a research advisor. Was that difficult for you? How did you choose who to work with? So when I was looking for an advisor, I wanted somebody who had research interests that were in alignment with mine. Really, at 
at the that first semester, that's when we are supposed to search for an advisor, go through the advisor matching process. I had nailed down what I wanted to do for my dissertation. I was torn between K through 12 students in engineering and black women in engineering industry. And so it, it was sort of difficult. And I, and I narrowed my top two down to individuals who, one individual, she does K through 12 work in engineering education. The other individual does research on identity and diversity in engineering. And so speaking with both of them, I decided to go with the professor who does research in identity and diversity in engineering. Um, her research focuses on understanding intersections of multiple identities, including race, gender, things like disability, sexual orientation. Um, so I felt like she probably would have been the best fit since if I would have went through K through 12, my focus would have been on black students or minority students. And then the black women in engineering, it would be black women. I had conversations with her before I was matched with her, of course. And she still supports me doing K through 12 work as like side projects. So mm-hmm. that, that was a plus. I also wanted an advisor who would be supportive of, of me and my specific interests as a black woman, um, someone who understands or is working towards understanding issues surrounding race that I'm concerned with, and someone who can understand challenges that I myself as a black woman may encounter. And my advisor, she met all my criteria. She was also flexible with me and supporting me moving back home after my first year. So that was also very important because there were some individuals I met with and they were like, no, you need to be here for the entire time. Those are the mm. things that I but if you're not taking class, I, I guess it, that's why it didn't make sense to you. <laughs> like if you're not in the process of taking like classes that require you to be on campus, what is the purpose? Especially if you're focusing on get, collecting data related to, you know, black women. I don't think Purdue right. is the best space unless you only want to talk to college students. Right. Right. Um, but there, there's some advisors like that. And then some of them, want you to be there to also assist with their research projects. Mm -hmm. And for me, I had a fellowship. I was getting paid a stipend. I didn't need funding from anyone to work on their projects, but there were still people who expected me to support their projects, even though they wouldn't be funding me. That didn't make sense to me, Mm -hmm. but I still am supporting some of my advisors projects just for exposure and for the learning experience, but I'm not required to. Okay. And you're able to do that from home, right? Yes. Okay. That's, that's really cool. And I did some of that while I was there as well. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about your research? So I want to dive into the experiences of black women in engineering industry. As you probably know, or it's probably obvious, engineering is composed mainly of white men. And in general, there's not much research on black women in engineering. There's a lot of research on women in general, but that research doesn't account for women at different intersections. And intersectionality theory has shown that individuals at different intersections, um, for example, black women may experience things, situations differently than white women. So when we only focus on women, we ignore women of minority groups. And so in general, women leave engineering within five years after entering the field, it's 25% that leave. And so I want to know what's going on specifically with black women. And this is like fueled by my personal experiences working because I've had some challenges. I've been in situations where I was like, this is crazy. I'm leaving here. I can't deal with it. And I think that this all relates to engineering education because these cultures that we have within engineering and how people interact with each other, that has to start from somewhere that like that could begin within engineering education and the universities and the cultures that are being created there in those spaces. 
Yeah, and I also would assume that if you're teaching engineering to a specific group of people, so black women, I think it's only fair we get their minds prepared for some of those experiences that they will have, especially knowing that the, I guess, the retention rate of women in engineering is so low. You know, like there is something that is missing that is keeping women in this field anyway. So, There needs to be something in the education system that allows that mental preparation so that the retention rate can be improved. Right, exactly. Um, I had a leadership policy and change course this summer, well, not this past semester, and one of my proposed changes was to incorporate a course or curriculum in diversity and inclusion because students black and white need to be taught and from all other ethnic groups need to be taught how to create environments that are inclusive to all people. And the engineering departments need to be practicing this within their departments because there are departments that have a culture that's not inclusive and that is perpetuating to the students and then into the workforce. So those are some of the things that I'm interested in. What topics related to, I believe you said K-12 students, do you think you want to touch on as well? So I am interested in exploring engineering education for K-12 through students in minority areas, specifically majority black schools where I come from in my hometown area and surrounding areas a lot of the schools are majority black and I went back last December to speak to some STEM classes and they really don't have an understanding of engineering even though they're learning about it in class they they think of construction a lot of them haven't been exposed to things This isn't necessarily about engineering, but they thought it was amazing that I had flown on an airplane Mm -hmm. before. So just exposing those students from those populations to engineering, I'd like to learn if even short-term programming, like having visitors to come in to teach students or summer programs, would actually have an impact on students' perceptions or attitudes towards engineering Could those short-term programs help them have an increased interest in engineering and wanting to learn more? And I'm also interested in evaluating some of those STEM classrooms that they have in these rural areas to see if they really are making a difference in the students' lives and to see if the students are actually learning anything. Because a lot of times the teachers don't have enough preparation or support to carry out these STEM and engineering courses. Were there any challenges that you face as like a black woman in like higher ed? Overall, I would say no, because like even the head of the School of Engineering Education, her research is is in diversity and inclusion. And she looks at things like critical race theory things like that. So like, like my department is very culturally aware or sensitive and they're very supportive of minority students. Although I can say there, there are some people in the program who I, who I question and I'm like, Hmm, how do you really feel about me? (laughs) One day I did a research project and it was the end of the semester and we were doing poster presentations and my project was on examining culture in a computer programming lab and so my research involved looking at data tons and tons of video data examining one black male student everybody else in the class were white males there was maybe one other black female student and I was finding things related to race from my observations. And I was given my spiel with my presentation, discussing my research. And he goes, well, how do you know that guy treated him that way because of race? And I'm just thinking, well, nobody's going to straight out say, I'm treating you this way because you're black. Mm -hmm. But the way he came at me with his question 
was, it was just crazy. And I even had somebody else who was standing there come up to me later and they were like, just ignore him. He's a jerk. He has an issue with everything that involves diversity and inclusion. So I would say that was the closest thing to being a challenge that I faced. But I think I handled the question very well. Um, And I said that I can't say for sure, but my observations are backed up by such and such theory and all of these other observations and things that have taken place in the classroom. So, yeah, I think I handled it well. But overall, I haven't faced too many challenges as a Black woman in higher education, but I know within higher education, Black women face lots of challenges, especially in other engineering disciplines. Um, There's a retention problem as well. So outside of your like higher ed, you definitely had some experiences at work, I'm sure, as a black woman working as an engineer. And I'm assuming that's what prompted you to write your book, Conquer. Girl, yes. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Woo. That first job I had, I was in a developmental program. After I completed the program, I got a position as a lead systems engineer on a team, a core team of about five people. I was the only black person. I was the only female. I was the only millennial on that team. All the other individuals, there was a a program manager, a logistician, a budget analyst, and someone else who worked with contracting. All of them were white men above the age of 50. So as you can imagine, it it was very difficult. I really had to work to prove myself, um, to prove my value. I I had the logistician, he would micromanage me and he was not an engineer. He knew nothing about engineering. And a lot of these guys were retired military and they they wanted to talk to you like they were in the military giving orders. So it was very difficult at times. I can remember one day the logistician who micromanaged me got loud with me in the office because I had made my travel plans for a work trip without consulting him. And I let him know that I let him know sternly and politely at the same time, if you can do that, that you will not raise your voice at me in this office. I can make my travel plans without consulting you. If you wanted to know, all you had to do was ask me. And I had some people come up to me later and was like, I'm glad you stood up for yourself. (laughs) And he eventually came back and like apologized. But it's rough. They think they can talk to you any kind of way. They don't think that you know what you're doing. They have to double check with another engineer who's been there longer than you and come to find out that engineer knows who you are, knows your work, and supports what you do. So in the end, they look crazy. Mm. So I'm assuming, too, that after dealing with something as intense as what you're describing, going to grad school at like in your program was just even if it was that something that was like a microaggression you don't even see it cuz you had just dealt with some crazy yes i've had you get my book i've yes. had a man call me out of my name when i just approached him and asked to have a a, a meeting to discuss an issue that was going on mm-hmm. and he called me out of my name and boy, mm-mm-mm. have you ever lost your cool? Like, and you just were like, you know what? Enough is enough. I am like, and just go off. Or did you always learn how you started meditating and learning how to control? Cause anger is anger. So if someone yeah. can yell at you naturally. So I'm, I'm the type of person that like, if you're raising your voice at me or yelling at me, I shut down and I don't hear anything. Like, oh, it, it's no. over with. We, we're we not having this conversation. We got to do it later. But when the guy called me out of my name, he walked away. He he was like, it was like a passing by in the hallway anyway. I was like, I want to talk to you later about this issue. 
and he goes, oh, you're, i am got to get my book, people. Yeah, get the, get the he, book. He, he, stands, he stands and keeps walking away. And at that point, really, I was kind of shocked. So it was like, mm-hmm. what did that just come out your mouth? Mm-hmm. And so he was gone, and I went to go talk to a colleague about what just happened <laughs> to process it in my mind. <laughs> Were you nervous about publishing a book and putting your stories out there? Or was it, well, you shouldn't have, like, I'm going to put it out there. I'm not going to put your name. But, I mean, it's my story. I I wasn't nervous, but I had somebody who had looked at it and gave me feedback. And they were like, I don't think you should put people's names in here. They might try to sue you. I don't mm-hmm. follow that up. But I, it, it was my story. It was my truth. It was what happened to me. And I wanted to share it with other women because other women are probably going through some of the same things. Some of them may not know what to do. Some of them may take the treatment. Some of them may run away, but they don't have to. And I just wanted to show women that you're not alone and you can make it through this. You don't have to take the disrespect, discrimination, mistreatment, or anything. Stand up for yourself. And so I wanted to put that out there. So I did change the names of individuals. I changed like position titles. So if a co-worker had the book or someone who worked at the company had the book it would be sort of difficult for them to sort of go back and match who who was who unless they were there (laughs) unless they were there yeah but even if they weren't there some of them who worked there may be able to figure it out but yeah I took the names out can't wait to read it going through graduate school and I'm like these microaggressions but when you go to work I can only imagine that it would not to say it has to be worse but if I'm going to work for a company that isn't doing the work to do better I can only expect that it may be something that will continue on into my work life as well So I appreciate you for sharing your story and making it open because we don't learn that in school, which I'm sure is why you probably wrote the book. We we go, we get these high, like these chemistry science majors and we go work for these companies and we don't learn in school that, oh yeah, by the way, when you actually go do your job, you can't barely do your job because you're too worried about what X, Y, and Z is going to say to you and stress you out or whatever. Right. And I I wanted to say something about that earlier. I forgot, but you you reminded me of it. I went to HBCU. It was family oriented, like I said, love and support. I don't think I was prepared Mm -hmm. to go into that workforce being surrounded by individuals who treated me less than. I didn't expect it at all. I didn't see it coming. And so I really had to learn on my own how to handle those situations and lean on support networks who were at at the company like like Nesby. But yeah, I think students need to know what they're getting themselves into and they need to be prepared to go into those environments so that they can stand up for themselves. On another note, you are actually a triple minority, right? You're a black woman and you're soon to be mommy. So, yeah. yes, I know your experience might be a little different than some other people who are in graduate school because now you are home working on your um your degree, but I wonder what is it like being pregnant while pursuing your PhD? So that the first trimester was hard. I was I was on campus then. It was okay. it was so hard because I was tired. I had morning sickness. Some days I would just sleep all day and I feel so bad. Like, oh my gosh, I have so much work to do. And I would end up cramming in work on the weekends. Um so it it was really hard in the beginning. Um, But once the first trimester passed, um, I started to get my energy back. And I have some classmates who have kids. And then there is someone in my program. She's been there 
three years now, she had her baby while she was in grad school. So she's really been very supportive throughout the whole process. She even threw me a baby shower um, at school, which was really nice. So she's been very supportive and helpful. The Engineering Education Student Government Association has a parent committee for individuals with kids. So they do activities together. I'm not there anymore, so I won't be able to experience that. But I think that that's very good. But moving forward now that I'm back home, I still will have to manage having a baby and graduate school. And I'm also working again as well. So those are three big things to manage. Family, baby, work, and school. So, And I just wonder because like when you're on a college campus, I've been listening to pot. It's called Her STEM Story is a podcast I've been listening to. And they were talking about their experiences like being moms on campuses and essentially campus. They don't have any like facilities and those resources for moms because there is so like single person college student oriented on college campuses so that's why I wonder like it would be different but definitely still intense because you are home and you are working so that's super intense to be working working on your degree to you know just being a, a mom like yeah so we'll see how it works out we'll see if I can manage both school and work you will or if work has to be dropped for a little bit but I want to say Purdue, they do really good as far as facilities. They have a child care center. My classmate who has, well, both of my classmates who have kids, their kids go to the child care center on campus. And it's like this state of the art facility. They have like the, I think the people who work there have master's degrees or something they were saying, which was like crazy working at a child care center. So they Purdue's really good for that. I know other universities aren't equipped, but Purdue is. And you said you were tired a lot. Do you feel like it affected your like ability to think clearly and things like that? Yeah, so they say you you have you get pregnancy brain. I don't think it really affected my ability to think clearly. Like I would have to be in a good place to do work. Like I would have had to be well rested and just ready to go and work because most of the times, like I said, I was tired. And if I tried to do anything, I wouldn't be thinking clearly in those moments when I was tired. So when I would have those small spurts of energy, that's when I made sure I would get some work done. You're you're pushing through, you're getting through this PhD program. You said that, you know, if it came down to it, you're booting work, not the PhD program. So what inspires you to keep going and finish? What inspires me really is my passion for students. And I really want to make a difference. And I think that I really want to support students minority students, especially African-American students who want to pursue engineering because it's something that they really are passionate about. I want them to be able to make it through their engineering programs to succeed in the engineering workforce and become leaders. And I believe that they need more people out there to support them and push them and let them know that they can do it because there are so many forces at play, systemic forces that want to kick them out of engineering. And so I just want to be that person to support our African-American students that are coming up now. And then my baby's my motivation. (laughs) I got a new motivation now to keep pushing through. Yes, give your baby someone to look up to. And like my mommy uh, is a doctor. So actually I got to be on my P's and Q's, okay? (laughs) Yes, yes, you do. <laughs> Little baby. I, that's so beautiful. <laughs> well, I want to just say thank you so much. I cannot wait to share your message with the world. I can't wait to read the book. Like, I'm so excited for all that you have in store for you to get your research done and for you to get the, become Dr. Paige Brown. And I, I look forward to seeing that. Do you have any last things you want to say? 
I just want to say thank you, Alicia, for having me. Thank you, the researcher. <laughs> <laughs> thank um, you. It has been a pleasure. Keep doing what you're doing. I really admire your podcast and the work that you're doing. And I wish you the best of luck defending. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed that episode. If you want to connect with Paige, she is at Mrs. Paige Brown on Instagram and also mrspagebrown.com if you are interested in getting a book and keeping up with her and her journey. If you want to find me, I am at the Research Her on the socials. And you can connect with me at theresearchher.com. And until next time, I holla.